right. Well, thank you, Brantley, for that wonderful uh, introduction. I, I'm pretty sure you know, it seems like you, you know better the function of my book than I do. Um, after that, uh, that I think uh, what you said perfectly captures, like, uh, I, I guess the, the value added of, of the approach that, that I've uh, tried to take um, when it comes to exploring the topics that, that, I, that I do explore. Um, so let me go ahead and switch over to um, the presentation that I'm going to uh, provide for everyone today. Um, so uh, I just want to say off, uh, you know, first off, this, this project is focused primarily on the two uh, historical eras of China and Japan that, uh, that Brantley uh, mentioned. So early 20th century China, 1912 to 1949, and uh, 16th century Japan. As as two cases of of state collapse, uh, in other words, of, of states that have collapsed, but then subsequently have been reconstituted. But I also want to point out that uh, in the book, I also um, consider a couple of uh, a, a few other cases as well, and I'll get into exactly methodologically speaking how these other cases relate to my two principal cases of China of Republican China and Sengoku Japan in just a, just a moment, but. Generally speaking, uh, you know, kind of this follow on on, on, on something that Brantley said is um, something that I've tried to do and, uh, uh, and that I, I hope I have succeeded in doing in this book is, is uh, um, emphasize the importance of, of these various concepts that, that, I, that I use and I, uh, you know, improve upon uh, from, from prior political science work across many different contexts, both historically and geographically. And and I hope that at the very least, you know, I, I I've shown that that it's plausible that the the various arguments that my book presents um, can uh, can have some some utility in in explaining uh, what is you know in reality a pretty common phenomenon throughout history, which is uh, state collapse and reconstitution. Just a real quick shameless plug, though. So this is the book. Uh, it's available on Amazon. If you buy the e version, it's only forty eight ninety five, like really, really cheap. If you really want to hold like a material copy, it's only one hundred and fifty dollars. I know, like just rock bottom prices these days. It's amazing. Um, but anyway, let's move on uh, to you know what is it? That, what is the problem that has motivated uh, this study of mine? I've been work full disclosure. I've been working on this study for uh, all. Almost, I, I worked on it for almost the entire time I was in graduate school, uh, getting earning my dissertation. So it's that's that, that was about eight years ago, um, and I, I you know I, I would say that it, it was uh, for a long time it was a work in progress, and I think it still is. Um, I think that you know when one of one of the things that I've learned from from all the people that I've interacted with throughout my academic life is is that you know when it comes to investigating an issue, you're never really done with that. And, and a published book is ultimately just kind of a snapshot of where you of where your own knowledge and understanding is at a given moment in time. And if I have time today, I would like to kind of touch on some additional directions of future research that I've been working on since the book has been published. But before we get there, um, just I want to clarify exactly what it is that's, that's motivated this study. Um, Simply, it's just that some cases of state collapse uh, have culminated in state re reconstitution, whereas others haven't. And I think this is actually rather remarkable because one thing that I've learned when by by you know reading about collapsed states, whether it be in uh, early 20th century China or 16th century Japan or or uh, contemporary sub-Saharan Africa, is that when a state collapses, there is this remarkable instability that uh, just ends up pervading all of society. And it's, this instability can be good and bad. It has led to remarkable innovations in how societies have organized themselves, innovations in, uh, pre, you know, more precisely, how societies have, have viewed their collective identities, how they have viewed their um, the the ability for governments to to structure social relations, but they've also led to tremendous conflict. Um, um, I, it seems that without exception, state collapse inevitably leads to to civil war of some kind. 
and economic and social dislocation. And today we see that collapsed states are a major source of instability. And in fact, you know, even when it comes, when it comes, not not just for the uh, for the for the societies themselves that have seen their their governments utterly fail, but the world as a whole. Um, you know, international terrorism, one of the sources of it, have or, or at least one of the one of the contexts that has facilitated uh, international terrorism have been collapsed states. You know, we can see that in the case of um, the, of the of the groups in Somalia today that have launched terrorist attacks in neighboring countries, most prominently in in, uh, in Kenya, in neighboring Kenya. And in fact, since 1975, uh, I. I, uh, I, I tallied up all the cases of state collapse and it seems that there's at least 17 clear cases of state collapse. Of those, only four have clearly resulted in successful state reconstitution. The other cases either, uh, the, the, the societies remain, uh, they, their, their states remain collapsed or, or there's been some sort of partial rebuilding of the state, but we cannot say with, I think with confidence, that that the state has truly been reconstituted, and um, again, kind of building on, on a point that Brantley made better, better, well, frankly, better than better, better than I've made it, um, is that political scientists, uh, political science in general, the discipline can really benefit from looking at previous eras, and you know, not we, I don't think we should assume that the modern era is somehow uh, special. Or 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 uh, distinctive in such a way that that it's not it wouldn't be fruitful to compare what we what we experience today with what human societies have experienced in the past. So, with that in mind, I've tried to focus on um, on on looking at these at, at historical cases, and in particular, I'm interested in endogenous state reconstitution. So a number of researchers, uh, most prominently David Lake and his colleagues, have focused on the 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 the, the challenges of externally led state building and how, generally speaking, ex externally led state building uh, uh, doesn't work. Uh, he 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 argues that uh, in his recent articles in his, in his recent research that that really Japan and Germany after World War II are the only two clear cases of externally led successful state building. For the most part, when external forces come in, um, it, it's, it has rarely been that successful. I, I think that we could argue that cases like Sierra Leone, for example, um, would, would be another instance of successful externally led state building, or at least a case where there was a substantial degree of external intervention. But at the same time, you know, we're only talking about a decade on. In the case of that country, it's not completely clear that it's going to that it would be uh, that it's an unqualified success. So with that with that issue in mind, I'm I'm one focusing instead on this alternative um, understanding of how state reconstitution occurred. Uh, that is an endogenous version wherein domestic actors, by and large, are the primary. Um, drivers of state formation within their societies, and I, and I, and I'm approaching it from this angle because I think that it, just intuitively it makes sense that that this endogenous form of state reconstitution, rather than let's say exogenous, to keep the terminology consistent, um, is more likely to be durable because you it, it you you have actors who are vested in the future directly of that society uh, in, uh, leading the process, whereas external actors ha often have their own interests for why they are engaging in state building in a different country. And those interests may not align with, with, the, with the interests of, of, the, of the society that, that they are purportedly assisting. In addition, there's been relatively little theorization on this subtype. There's been a lot uh, a lot written on external led state building and the problems that that it that it faces. So I felt that you know, from a more traditional, you know, where where are the gaps in the literature uh, approach? That this also can be uh, that this 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 study can also be uh, potentially valuable. And so I'm going to expand on this this new theory that I've developed 
in much greater detail. But just as a preview, um, what I primarily focus on are two, we would call two uh, non-material types of causes and one material types of type of cause. So ideology, political symbolism, and geopolitical space are the three principal causal factors that I focus on when constructing my new theory of, of, of endogenous state reconstitution. And so I think ideology is pretty self-explanatory. I wanna emphasize that here, uh, I'm talking about just a framework, uh, uh, an intellectual framework that is used to uh, help structure uh, one's understanding of the world and provide some kind of um, potential future that an individual and or individuals can work towards. So we're not simply, I'm not simply talking about an ideology that, that, that justifies the status quo. And indeed, I'm actually talking about the opposite. I'm talking about ideologies that provide groups with some vision of the future that they can work towards. And I think that that's an incredibly important aspect of ideology that my theory uh, um, really rests heavily on. Then the second aspect of political symbolism, this refers to a much more amorphous kind of non-material factor uh, that isn't, isn't really, in, that it doesn't speak to some coherent framework that is uh, used to uh, structure our comprehension of of society and provide us with with a clear-cut goal. Rather, it this political symbols serve as these uh, these very um, like I said amorphous, but because of the but because of that potentially widely appealing ideas about uh, that that are associated with the unity of a society. And so I think I think this like a general vision. Of a of a unified nation state of, of the fact the idea that a society should remain coherent in some form is it would be an example of a contemporary political symbol. But I do provide other examples from 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 pre, from a pre modern era of, of of political symbolism. And then geopolitical space, I actually struggled with 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 this because I understand that geopolitical often is used to refer to the international sphere. Um, and so it's, it's, it can be a bit misleading, but I want to emphasize that here geopolitical is basically just a contraction of geographic dash political space. So here I'm focusing on space within a country, like actual physical space that is geographically marginal and has relatively low levels of, uh, or a, a relatively low density of politically powerful groups. For space, uh, uh, physical space in a in a country that meets those two criteria. That is, it is geographically marginal, and it has a relatively low density of, politi of politically powerful groups. In, according to my theory, is going to be very favorable to uh, state builders who are who are uh, striving to unify or reunify their state society. So again, I'm going to I'm going to talk a bit more about these factors in just a moment. But first, I want to emphasize that uh, one of the principal ontological assumptions, if you will, of, of this theory is that you have intentional uh, purposes and in, purposive individuals that, I, that I've termed unifiers, which I've actually gotten from the, from the historical literature on Sengoku Japan. But I think that the concept can be applied throughout, you know, I, you know, outside of that of that context. These, you have individuals who are intentionally trying to rebuild the state and they attempt to do so by one, exploiting favorable structural conditions that I will, I will delineate in just a moment, to deploy specific state building strategies with the intentional goal of reunifying their country. And they do so through another, a new concept that I've created called the reunification campaign, which is a, uh, which is a, we could call it a political military campaign that is that who, whose goal is is in explicitly the reunification of a country's uh, political structures. And so, in other words, my theory is oriented around this interplay between structure and agency. So I, I you know, I know there has long been this debate over whether structure or agency is more important when it comes to 
um, uh, human relations in general. And I think that, uh, like you know, like other authors before me, I believe that that dichotomy is misleading. And really, and any any comp any uh, I think comprehensive theory of of society needs to take into account both the structural conditions that in this case can be favorable towards state re to restate constitution, but also the specific strategic actions that unifiers must, must take in order for those structural conditions to actually uh, have their effects felt um, down the line. And in this case, uh, uh, those effects would be uh, related to the reconstitution of a state. So the methodology that I use, it's, it's qualitative. I only focus on, I only look at five cases in the book. Um, but I, from, from the outset, I was focused on developing a most different same outcome research design, wherein all of the cases have a common outcome. So they are, are in other words, they are uh, invariant on, on that key aspect, but they vary on many other potential factors. And by doing so, the, the goal, at least, is to isolate a relatively few number of factors that those cases share. And it's through this controlled comparison that, you know, the uh, one can hope we can develop a transferable theoretical framework. So in other words, not one that uh, explicitly claims to explain all cases of a given type. So in this case, all cases of state reconstitution, but rather it, 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 it facilitates the creation of a, of a theoretical framework that is uh, structured in such a way uh, it's in, through, for example, the concepts that are uh, used to organize it, that it can be transferred to new cases and tested on those cases without substantially changing the framework in the process. Unless, of course, the new cases you've tested it on uh, are, are simply not supported by the framework that you've developed. I, I, I'm very much, I very much couch this study in the comparative historical analysis tradition. And uh, if, when uh, reading through that tradition, one of, one, of the, one of the things that really sticks out as very important to those practitioners is this, this focus on uh, uncovering certain, certain systematic factors that we observe across many different cases, but also recognizing that those systematic factors usually combine with more case specific factors. And so given that I'm using a most different same outcome research design, uh, in order to further this goal of comparative historical analysis, I have decided to focus on necessary conditions. So also when, when I'm, when I present my, the, the, the framework in its, uh, in its completeness, I want to emphasize that these are all necessary conditions. And in every case that I look at, there are ultimately other uh, very highly contextual factors that also play key roles in pushing these unifiers and their reunification campaigns to a, to, to a successful conclusion. And I also should emphasize that this theoretical framework was formulated through an iterative inductive logic. So the two principal cases that I look at uh, Republican China and Sengoku Japan, I, to a large extent, used those cases to develop the theoretical framework. So I don't, I don't present those cases as evidence that my framework works because in, after all, part, in part, the framework is itself based on the experiences of those, of those countries. But what I have done in the book is I pro pro provided three additional test cases in, in, a one, in, one, in the second to last chapter, uh, specifically 20th century Ethiopia and Uganda, and 10th century China um, to see if this framework does in fact transfer to other very different contexts. And in some ways it does, and in some ways it doesn't. You know, and I'm very upfront about that. It's, uh, you know, and I, again, that's why I think this is all a work in progress, right? Is that, you know, we're always learning something new. And th there, there, there were some aspects of the framework that I think, uh, certainly the conceptual framework, I think, uh, transfers uh, very ably to these other cases, but the, the specific causal claims that I do, that I do make with regards to China and Japan, um, for some of the cases, like with Ethiopia is probably the test case where it, my framework most, most, is most readily uh, applicable. 
uh, Uganda and, and Song China have their, have their uh, respective difficulties. So uh, without further, further ado, let's, let's, let's talk about this theoretical framework uh, in it in, in, that, I've, that I've developed. This is, this, this is the main purpose of, after all, um, is, is this new framework that I've developed. So like I said earlier, this ontological basis is the, dual, is the idea of the duality of structure that Anthony Giddens developed in the 70s and 80s. This idea that, that's, that you cannot, you cannot, you really can't separate analytically structure and action. You have to, you have to consider it, you have to take into account the interplay of the two um, simultaneously. And also, in addition to that, since I'm focusing on state, for, a, a kind of state formation, um, a, a review of the state formation literature, I think, identifies essentially two key imperatives of any of any state builder, of, of, of any individual who's striving to um, um, uh, to uh, uh, rebuild the state in this case. And that is, they need, uh, state builders need res access to resources, and these can be material resources such as uh, ar uh, arms, uh, food to feed uh, men uh, in, your, in your army, um, but it also can include uh, ideological resources, or ideational resources, I guess you could say. Um, there and this speaks to this idea of the role of ideology and, and political symbolism. I, I think that actors need not only access to the to, to the material power to uh, that uh, the economic and coercive power that I that I do think is necessary for state building, but they also need access to these various ideational uh, ideational types of resources as well. And then the second imperative is social control, and uh, in other words, state builders, since they are after all trying to create a a kind of uh, social order, they need to be able to enforce that order. And to the extent that they are unable to control the parts of society that, that they over time um, uh, are trying to extend their authority over, uh, that, that will prove to be an insurmountable obstacle to their, to their ultimate goal. So they have to in some way uh, not only gain access to the resources they need, that they need in order to, accomp uh, to accomplish their goals, but they also need in the process to ensure that the, that the social groups that they're trying to govern uh, are in fact under their control, um, at least, at least in, some, in some key ways. So with that and with those two uh, foundations in mind, let's turn to the three causal pairs of structural and strategic necessary conditions that comprise my theoretical framework. So the first one is a spec is the availability or development of a specialized ideological framework. So here I'm just simply referring to some relatively coherent uh, um, collection of idea uh, of concepts pertaining to number one how society operates and number two uh, what what ideal kind of society do we want to have as a group. And unifiers can use a specialized ideological framework to, as I call it, cohere their core supporters. And this simply, just, this simply refers to the idea that they're able to bring their core supporters uh, in line with this long-term project. So I borrow from the work of Max Weber and Stephen Hansen on this idea that, that short-term interests can often do considerable damage to some uh, long-term project. And you need some way of getting your core, support, core supporters on board with a, with, with a program that can have a very long time horizon. So in other words, you need to elong elongate their time horizons. And both Weber and Hansen argue that, that an ideal, uh, uh, ideology can serve that purpose. So I borrow from, from their ideas to develop this idea of a specialized ideological framework that unifiers can use to develop a coherent group of supporters that will stick with them uh, through thick and thin over the, over the course of many, many years. Uh, you know, in the case of the Chinese communists, for example, it would be decades from their founding to when they actually successfully uh, reunified China and uh, un under their own authority. The second causal pair uh, is uh, includes the the structural condition of the presence of a nationally nationally legitimated symbol, and here nationally just simply means society wide. 
So I want to emphasize that that nationalism or the or the 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 basic uh, concepts that nationalism is often organized around, like the idea of a of a single organic whole of a society, um, is one kind of a nationally legitimated symbol. But I'm using the term nationally in a much broader sense and in, in a much uh, you could say simpler sense to just simply refer to any symbol that is widely shared by politically relevant groups in a society. It may or may not be in the, it may or may not take the form of modern nationalism. Um, and I find that if we look in the previous pre-modern eras of history, we do identify, uh, we, or, or we can identify various kinds of nationally legitimated symbols. And unifiers can use these kinds of symbols to incorporate social groups outside their uh, reunification campaign. In other words, we're talking about groups distinct from their core supporters. A, a unifier needs their core supporters to do the do the heavy lifting and do the work that's necessary to uh, uh, fight fight their rivals on the battlefield to uh, develop the structures of government that are going to that are going to serve as the basis for this future unified state. But they also need other groups in society to at the very least not get in their way, at least, at least acquiesce to these grand goals that they have. And, I, and perhaps ideally provide uh, out, active outside support. And so this is what I refer to by incorporation. This uh, at, at minimum acquiescence to the goals of the, re of the reunification campaign and, and at best um, uh, active support for that campaign. But in either case, we're still talking about groups that are that are not part of this uh, set of core supporters. And I can talk about in the Q and A like some of the some of the more uh, conceptual details about that distinction if, if if people are interested in. Then the third causal pair uh, is that areas with high degrees of geopolitical space must be present in the country. And so, like I was saying earlier, uh, a, a high a, a, geo, a spaces with high degrees of, geopol of geopolitical space would include those that are geographically marginal. So we're talking about um, border regions, for example, between provinces where they are, uh, where they're, they're perhaps very, uh, very mountainous, uh, very inaccessible to uh, common thoroughfares like pertaining to trade and just generally population movement. Uh, and, um, and this typically goes along with, with, with that, first, that first requirement, uh, a relative lack of politically powerful groups. And this might seem counter, counterintuitive. After all, you know, we were earlier I was talking about the importance of access to resources. So why, so why do I think that unifiers would be best served to, to, uh, to operate in these areas with relatively low levels of resources? You know, these, these, these border regions with, that often have very little arable land, for example, don't have very many individuals living there. Well, it's, it's the issue of, of uh, breathing room. In other words, Geo, a high uh, physical spaces with high degrees of geopolitical space um, are, are able to provide uh, fledgling reunification campaigns. So at the very beginning of the reunification, reunification campaign, when the, the unifier, it has just, all the unifier has is this dream of, of a reunified state and maybe a small set of very hardcore supporters, but is, you know, is nowhere near having the coercive and social resources at his or her disposal to actually try to implement that dream. And in other words, they're very vulnerable at the, at the beginning of, of, these, of, of these campaigns. And I argue that this vulnerability requires some kind of incubator. And I argue that areas with high degrees of geopolitical space can serve as a kind of incubator for these fledgling unit reunification campaigns. And specifically, what, what, they, what these areas permit is the possibility that unifiers can effectively disempower local elites and gain direct access to resources. So I borrow extensively from Victoria Timbor Hui's book on uh, state building in ancient China and early modern Europe, where she argues that uh, state builders who are able to gain direct access to the resources that they need, as opposed to working through intermediaries, are going to be much more successful in the long run. And I believe that this is also the case for state reconstitution. 
to the extent that unifiers are dependent on other power holders for access to their needed resources, the more they're going to be uh, uh, beholden to those other power holders' interests, which may or may not align with, with their grand goals of reunifying the state. And so being able to develop structures, political structures that enabled the disempowerment of local elites is going to be really crucial for the success of any reunification campaign. And I argued that areas with high degrees of geopolitical space can provide the breathing room, can serve as these incubators for the development of these, uh, of these institutions that provide direct access to resources. So I um, hope I'm not taking too long, but uh, we'll, we'll just see how long I, long I can go. Um, I, 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 I think, uh, Brian, you said you're going to give some, some kind of a notification, right? Uh, I'm running out of time. So uh, I'll I will. Next. Okay, great. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, so let's, let, let, let's, so next, let's, let's look at the two cases that I primarily use to develop this theoretical framework. So again, you know, this is by, this, these by and large were used inductively on my part. Um, but I nonetheless, you know, I guess not surprisingly, the theoretical framework, I think, does a pretty good job of explaining uh, why these two cases did result in successful state reconstitution. So this is a, a, a map of Republican China circa 1926 showing the various uh, warlord groups. So for those who don't know, in the 1920s in China, uh, the, uh, the Chinese territory was, was uh, uh, parceled up, parceled amongst a number of warring warlords. Uh, there is a reason, of course, why they are called warlords. They often fought each other. Uh, on, there, there are many, many wars in this period. And uh, this, this, is, this map is, I just provide this map just to really emphasize the extent of uh, fragmentation in the Chinese polity during this period and, and the challenges that, that uh, uh, unifiers like Mao Zedong uh, and Chiang Kai-shek uh, faced. Uh, when they when they were working to reunify the Chinese state, I want to point out that I only look at the the successful reunification campaign of this era, which would be uh, the, the the Chinese Communist campaign, because that's that's the that's the focus of my uh, methodology, right? Is on is on successful cases of state reconstitution. So in my book, I do mention the nationalists. Nationalists, I do discuss Chiang Kai-shek and, and his nationalist party, the, the Guomindang. Um, but, but only in connection with how their actions uh, uh, interacted with the strategies and conditions of, of the Chinese communists. But uh, that, that, is, that is another, another um, a strand of future research that I definitely want to tackle, is to see how this theoretical framework uh, does in explaining cases of, of, of failure, right? and including in countries where like, like in the case of Republic in China, where you have kind of you have competing reunification campaigns, I think it'd be very fascinating to dive more deeply into into that dynamic of of competition between reunification campaigns. So uh, this is just a broad overview of 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 the of the of the two chapters in the book that actually go in much greater detail on how this theoretical framework applies. To Republic in China and Sengoku Japan, but just just in really broad strokes, the specialized ideological framework that the Chinese Communists use it was not surprisingly Marxism Leninism, uh, and so this 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 ideology provided that long term goal. It also provided a it, it, uh, a uh, a sense of what what a righteous society should look like. It provided very a very clear moral purpose to uh, Mao and his core supporters, and therefore it, it helps serve that function that an ideology can serve, which is to cohere core supporters, keep them dedicated to some long-term cause. In part, it primarily because of its of the perceived uh, justness of that ideology. The nationally legitimated symbol at the time is, I think, again, uncontroversially, would have, would be, would have been the unified Chinese nation state. In the 1920s, uh, it, 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 it's apparent that uh, it's certainly amongst, amongst urban classes that this goal of reunifying the Chinese state, of having a powerful Chinese government once again, 
that is able to resist foreign uh, interference and incursions was incredibly important uh, for the vast majority of people in, 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 in at least in urban society, and I think that in, in rural society as well. And so th the real question is then, who's going to take advantage of this symbol? And Mao, I, in the book, uh, I argue that, that Mao did a much better job of this than Chiang Kai-shek did, especially in the 1930s. Um, and we can debate about, you know, why exactly Chiang Kai-shek made the decisions that he made. You know, was he, was he pushed in certain directions by factors beyond his control? I mean, given that I think that structure and agency are inextricable, you know, it, we, we, one can never fully say that that one individual is entirely free in their decisions. But it seems, at least just focusing on the Chinese communists, even if we don't compare what they did to what the Guomindang under Chiang Kai-shek did, we can see that, that Mao certainly attempted to use this, this, this ideal of the unified Chinese nation state very, very actively in uh, trying and very actively in getting uh, in working to get support from groups outside of the Chinese Communist Party. And I think the, the United Front era would be uh, in the 1930s on would be a really good example of this of the of a use of the nationally of this nationally legitimated symbol to incorporate external uh, social groups. And then finally, and I think uh, just personally, the most fascinating aspect of this uh, case study is that that the, the communists uh, did in fact find their greatest success in these areas with high degrees of geopolitical space. So the uh, Yan'an area in, in Northern Shanxi province was incredibly out of the way. It was very impoverished. And I don't, I don't, think, it, I don't think they became powerful despite them having their, their main base operations from 1934 on in that remote region of the country. I think it's because they were in that remote region of the country. And so generally speaking, I believe that border regions um, and peripheral provinces in, in the case of China uh, in this era uh, would, be, uh, would be the areas that um, we would expect unifiers to have the greatest success in establishing early on um, their reunification campaigns. So here's some more details on, uh, on how uh, Mao and the CCP took advantage of these structural conditions. Um, I already mentioned some of these. Uh, and I guess I will also, I also like to point out that, 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 that there's, there are interactions between these. These are not, I do not consider in the actual narrative, the causal narrative that I present in the book, I don't, and, uh, stru uh, in the way I structure them, structure the narrative, they are treated separately, but I do uh, point out when they work together. So for example, the implementation of land reform which was a key part of the CCP's ideological program, not only served as a, as a means to cohere core supporters by demonstrating the seriousness of CCP leaders in actually furthering the communist cause, but it also served to, at least to some extent, disempower local elites. And so it serves multiple purposes here. Here's a, a great map of the Long March illustrating how the Chinese communists took advantage, I don't know, you know, to what extent was it intentional? Um, cer certainly they, they left uh, southern Jiangxi province because they were being uh, attacked by the nationalists. Um, and they ended up in the northern, you can see where the arrows end up, that, that, that is the Yan'an area where they ended up um, and established their, their, their first permanent base of support. Uh, one one that lasted in you know until uh, until uh, victory in 1949. Um, it, it it was it's very out of the way, and it it was far from the center of nationalist power, which was primarily in the southern half of the country. And I think that these were factors that proved incredibly important in the uh, development of the Chinese Communist Reunification Campaign. Again, I'm happy to talk more about all this stuff in the Q&A if, if we have interest. But I would like to move on to the next major case, which is Sengoku, Japan. So we're going to go back in time by about almost 500 years. Um, I, uh, I, I actually enjoy, you know, I, I, think, I think it can be very fruitful. Uh, it, it is a challenge to compare cases across centuries, but I think it's very fruitful when we're able to do so. Because it, it shows us to what extent are different historical areas truly distinct from each other. And to what extent 
do we see certain common processes and common problems and solutions across different areas? And it really helps give us a sense of, you know, to what extent is humanity across time more unified than I think oftentimes we, we, we might think. Uh, anyway, so Japan in the 16th century, similar to China in the 1920s, was incredibly fragmented. So here we have, uh, this map shows the various um, uh, uh, spheres of influence, domains, as they were, as they're called in the historical literature, of the samurai daimyo. So daimyo just simply means great lord. Um, and so th these would be especially powerful samurai who, uh, who had large followings and controlled some, some uh, measure of territory, oftentimes more than one province. Um, and, but we can see that in the 1570s, 1560s, 1570s, it was still an incredibly fragmented country. And so in, in that sense, there's a long way to go for the country to be reunified. Uh, so given that, if we look at the structural conditions that were present by the 1570s, in Sengoku, Japan, we see some parallels with what we talked about with regards to Republic in China. So first of all, there, there was, I, I will be upfront here, there was no explicit ideology at the time. There was no mark, there was no ism that I've been able to identify um, in this period. But that said, there, there was a clear set of interlocking ideological concepts that daimyo em, uh, employed to justify their authority and to uh, get their core supporters to uh, maintain loyalty to them. And so th three of the key concepts include house codes, which were sets of regulations governing various samurai houses. And these were typically uh, devised by the leaders of those houses and primarily as a form of social control. C couple that with first, act, even though it's third on the list, First, the notion of kogi or public authority, which was used to justify daimyo claiming authority beyond their individual houses. So in other words, claiming authority over land, over an entire geographical area, rather than just simply their functional constituency, let's say, of the warrior class. And finally, tenka, which was most uh, most assiduously employed by first Oda Nobunaga, who was the first unifier of Japan, although he was assassinated before he could complete, he could finish the job, and his immediate successor, uh, Hideyoshi Toyotomi, uh, they both explicitly and regularly used the concept of tenka, which means it, it's uh, basically means uh, all the the it technically means all the whole universe, um, but it's it's basically just it's a very universalizing concept of authority. And what, 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 they, what they would do is they would use this, this idea of Tenka to justify their claims over the entire country of Japan. And indeed, actually even beyond. Hideyoshi had delusions of grandeur. He, he invaded Korea because he believed that he, he was not only justified to be leader of Japan, but he's also justified to be king of China. Uh, it didn't work out for him, uh, but this idea of Tenka, you know, it was, it was truly universalizing in that respect. So they employed these ideas of house, uh, these, these ideological concepts of house codes, public authority or kogi, and universal authority or tenka in, in a coherent manner. You know, th these, are not, th these are not haphazardly deployed. You, you, you see, especially in the case of Nobunaga and Hideyoshi, this concerted effort to use all three. And then finally, uh, the, the final unifier, because after Hideyoshi's death, there was a brief civil war period once more, and then um, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, uh, he founded the Tokugawa Shogunate, which ended up ruling Japan for the next 250 to 50 plus years. He also extensively employed house codes, as uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, that in just a moment. But in terms of the other two structural conditions, we see uh, the, an instance of another nationally legitimated symbol, in this case it would be the Japanese emperor, even throughout Sengoku Japan, even given the political fragmentation, the lack of a central government with, that, with functioning authority, the emperor remained, and the emperor remained as a source of symbolic authority. There was an, a system of imperial ranks and titles that daimyo would regularly try to uh, 
um, uh, uh, be, become a part of. They, 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 would, they would often ask for the emperor to uh, dispense with various imperial titles to, in order to provide themselves with greater legitimacy in the eyes of, uh, of politically important groups in society. So the emperor remained, again, no, with no real political authority, but with this, with this, with this uh, symbolism that provided at least some vague sense of social unity. And, and therefore provided the basis for some more coherent political unity uh, to be built on top of that. And then finally, there were also areas with high degrees of geopolitical space. And in the case of Japan, it's, it's a bit simpler to talk about this than with China, where in China you have to analyze the different border regions and the different provinces and get a sense of which were more marginal than others. And I talk about this in greater detail in the book. In Sengoku, Japan, by and large, if if you if you were if you're looking at a at a at a at a region outside the capital region centered around the the imperial city of, of Kyoto, you are looking at at regions that have relatively low levels or relatively high levels, excuse me, of geopolitical space, in the sense that that there were, there were far more politically powerful groups in the capital region than in surrounding provinces, and also in addition, we want to look at provinces. Where there were um, where, where there weren't any uh, major power holders that had survived the collapse of the previous state, and specifically here I'm talking about the uh, Shugo, which is uh, which was the name of the uh, of the group of powerful samurai lords who had uh, held power under the previous state. All right, I got five minutes, so I'm going to speed things up a bit. Um, I'm actually almost done with the main part, so I think we can, I'll just I'll just end once I once I get through this section. So, how did Hideyoshi and Ieyasu, Ieyasu um, take advantage of these structural conditions? So, um, by and large, it was similar to how Mao and the communists took advantage of their own structural conditions. So, they used, for example, like I said, they used Tenka to justify their campaigns. They intentionally embedded their coalition into the imperial system. So this is this be another example of how we have we see strategic conditions interacting with each other. So I mentioned in the, on the previous slide that the, that the nationally legitimated symbol in Japan was the emperor. The emperor also was what the ten was was what the ideological concept of tenka was associated with. It wasn't it was not identical to the to the Japanese emperor. Uh, and, or, or to the symbolism of the Japanese emperor. But Hideyoshi and Ieyasu tethered this notion of universal authority to the emperor, because, I mean, in part, I'm sure, because it just made logical sense, the emperor was, was the sole universal source of any kind of authority in Sengoku, Japan. So if we're going to talk about universal authority, we're going to, you know, inevitably, we have to address the role of the emperor. And they, they merged their own house codes and their own use of the of the concepts of tenka and kogi with the with the imperial system of ranks and titles and indeed they they act uh, hideyoshi in particular actively uh, actively gave his own supporters uh, imperial ranks and titles technically it would be the emperor bestowing them on on his supporters but he uh, through his through his uh, his um, uh, chorus of might was able to Pressure the emperor into 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 performing uh, these dispensa dispensations, and then Iyasu implemented a house code for the entire samurai class, the Buke Shohato, when he became uh, when when he became shogun in the early 17th century. Like I was talking about earlier, the emperor uh, was used to justify the goals of these of these uh, unifiers, and uh, Hideyoshi, for example, would would, would acquire outsider daimyos, in other words, daimyo that were not part of his core coalition, to accept Hideyoshi's court-bestowed family name. So he used the symbolism of the emperor to get these independent so, uh, actors, these other daimyo who were at least nominally his rivals, to take his family name and therefore, and, and perhaps in a more literal way, incorporate them into his, into his reunification campaign. And then finally, uh, I think if, uh, this, this map will probably be the most useful when talking about the last strategic condition uh, 
Uh, this map, the one on the left show, both on the left and the right, in the red circles indicate the provinces where a, a prominent Shugo was still in power. So these would be provinces where there was relatively less geopolitical space because there already was a powerful uh, uh, military figure, military political figure uh, dominating that part of the country. And in blue is blue is where we see major uh, new daimyo emerge over the course of the 1560s, 70s, and 80s. And we see that it, almost without exception, they emerged in provinces where there was not an existing Shugo present uh, as of the late 16th, uh, late 16th century. And then in purple, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, two purple circles correspond to the two provinces where Hideyoshi and um, uh, Nobun uh, Hideyoshi slash Nobunaga and Tokugawa, all three basically, uh, got their starts, in other words. And as you can see, they were near other uh, provinces that were governed by Shugo, but they were not in those provinces themselves. And I argue that, that this relative marginality provided them with, that, with these incubators that they could use that they could take advantage of to develop uh, the, the, the uh, beginnings of the core structures that they would need um, to uh, eventually reunify the state. So um, I think just as by way of conclusion, I want to emphasize that you know, uh, I, there are uh, three, case, three additional cases that I test the framework on. I'm happy to talk about those more in the Q&A if people have questions on that. And I think that in general, my goal here is to, what has been to present is to preview the theoretical framework that I present in the book that I hope provides some kind of uh, a, a transferable um, scheme that we can use to make sense of these cases of collapse political authority and subsequent um, uh, reconstitution. So um, thank you, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that any of you all have.